Hitting a baseball is not an exact science. Much of it has been poorly defined, and some things taught absolutely wrong for years. You'll find there aren't as many hard rules in hitting as you might have thought. The bat, to begin at the most obvious place, will vary from player to player. And I've always thought it was pretty hard to, for anybody to tell someone else, this is the right bat for you. Uh, it has to have, uh, for example, the right size handle for your hands. Uh, it should have the weight that, that feels like you can really handle. And I, when I talk about weight, I mean that something you can really stop or something you can really start with. My preference was a light bat, no more than 34 ounces. But again, it's an individual thing. It's the same with your hitting style. It's not a Williams style or a Ruth style. It's your style. Show me 10 different hitters, and I'll show you 10 different styles. Here are three of the greatest, and they were as different as day and night. Ty Cobb, Babe Ruth, and Tris Speaker. Speaker was a versatile line drive hitter who led the American League in doubles eight times. Cobb was probably the smartest hitter of all. He sacrificed power to be the most consistent hitter in baseball history and wound up with a lifetime average. No one will ever touch 367. Ruth was a power hitter greatest name in the history of American sport. Ruth was once needled about the fact that his salary was higher than President Hoover's. Ruth paused a moment and said, well, I had a better year. Ruth held his big bat way down at the end. He swung so hard he'd come right off his back foot. He struck out a lot, but he also hit 714 home runs. Lou Gehrig stayed more within himself more of a line drive hitter than Ruth, and didn't strike out as much, but he was a slugger too, because he ended up with 493 home runs and a 340 lifetime average. Mellock lifted his lead foot off the ground as he strode into the pitch. He led the National League in homers six times. Jimmy Fox had a big hitch in his swing, like Hank Greenberg and a lot of other great hitters. For 12 seasons in a row, he hit 30 or more home runs. Joe DiMaggio was a great stylish player of my day, but he also had the widest stance of any of the great hitters that I saw. Despite being so spread out, he never seemed to be off balance. Stan Musial, on the other hand, was so compact, he looked like a snake coiled up in the back of the box. He looked restricted at the start of his swing, but he came out of it all right and always finished strong. He had a lifetime average of 331 and led the National League in batting seven times. Willie Mays had an incredibly long stride, stretching out from the back of the box to the front. But boy, when he hit the ball, he was off and running. Mickey Mantle was the most powerful switch hitter of all time. He swung big all the time and like Ruth, struck out a lot. He had good natural style right or left. I remember when I first broke into baseball and I had seen a fellow hit the ball and boy he had great style and I was looking at Lefty O'Doul truly one of the great hitters in in baseball history. Uh, two months later I signed with the San Diego team and Lefty O'Doul was on the opposite opposite team and I went out to Lefty and I talked to him and I said Lefty I uh, asked him the question what do I have to do to become a good hitter? Well he had seen me uh, hit in practice only in practice and uh, he said, kid, he said, I've seen you hit. And he said, my best advice to you, he says, is don't let anybody change you. Now, here's what I mean. In his playing days, Ted Williams was generally considered to be the most artistic hitter in baseball. His swing today is still the finest example of good hitting form. I do recommend a compact stance and an extremely firm grip. The pressure on the fingers and not against the palms. The bottom hand holds the bat as you would a hammer. The index finger is slightly open. I hold my bat upright, almost perpendicular to the ground. The weight is balanced on both legs and slightly forward on the balls of the feet. The knees bent and flexible. The feet are solidly planted. See if in your stance you can reach any pitch in the strike zone without lunging or being awkward or losing control. Now, the moves of the hitter. The very first move you should make is one that has been ignored, the cocking of the hips. It's the root of batting power 
and it comes in unison with the beginning of the stride. The lead knee turns in to allow the hips and shoulders to rotate. The hands go back in cocking position. My lead foot strides toward the pitcher. The direction of the stride should not vary more than 10 to 15 degrees off a perpendicular line to the pitcher. As I make my decision to swing, my hips lead the way, opening up into the pitch, and the shoulders follow. My hands and forearms supply bat direction. Watch the red line on the hips and the blue line on the shoulders. Hip action is far ahead, helping to pull the arms and hands around. My hands are well in front of the bat as a full pivot is made. This is where quickness comes in. The bat comes around into the swing, but the wrists don't roll through the impact zone. That's important. The wrists have snapped just a little at impact, but it is a very slight snap and definitely not a roll. The power is applied before the wrist breaks. Now once more from the side, watch for the cocking of the knee, the hips and the hands as I stride. My hips clearly open up before my shoulders begin to bring arms and bat around. The bat lowering and flattening out to come into the same plane as the pitch. It is a slight upswing. And then at the final pivot, how my back foot turns and is pointed in the direction of the hips. Once you've made up your mind to swing, quickness with the bat is critical. Briefly, here's what happens. From the moment the ball leaves the pitcher's hand, a batter has about two-fifths of a second to make up his mind whether to complete that swing. Don't be distracted by the pitcher's moves, even if he's unorthodox. Focus your attention on that area his pitches ordinarily come from. Think of it as a 15-inch square window. That's where to look, whether he's a right-hander or a left-hander. There are two things that I think have been taught wrong in regard to the ideal swing. A lot of people say to swing level, which isn't too bad. Others say to swing down at the ball, which I think is real bad. But to me, the ideal swing has always been one that was slightly up, slightly up. The reason I say that is because the pitcher throwing the ball to the plate into the strike zone is delivering the ball at somewhere from four to eight degrees of angle. I think it makes sense to think that if you swing in the opposite plane in which the ball is being pitched from, that your chances of making contact are much greater. The pitcher stands on a mound 10 inches high. The ball leaves his hand about ear level and comes down to an area in the strike zone roughly three and a half feet off the ground. He aims for that area below waist level. The flight of the ball is down about five degrees. It would be difficult in fact to find a hitter who does not swing up or slightly up as Ted suggests. Two excellent examples are Al Kaline and Billy Williams. K-line swing and impact is up, the fat part of his bat in the trajectory of the ball as long as possible. The same is true of Billy Williams. As he comes into the ball, the swing starts up. The critical area of impact, the impact zone, is 12 to 18 inches. The longer the bat is kept on the plane of the pitch, the longer the impact zone. When the bat is swung level or down, the impact zone is drastically reduced. The second thing caught wrong is the overemphasis of the wrist snap. They wrote about my wrist, how powerful they were and how quick they were. They were wrong. It's not a wrist swing at all. It's a hard push swing with the hips, like hitting a tree, swinging up with an ax. Frank Robinson has been a star hitter in both the American and National Leagues and has what Williams calls great bat control. Notice how quick he is with his bat, using the axe swing Williams prescribes, and how, like all the great hitters, his hips lead the way. It's hard to be a good hitter without hip action, or to hit with any authority. The amount of hips uh, is proportionate to the amount of power that you get in your overall swing. Now, um, one of the truly great hitters in American League history has been Harmon Killebrew. 
I've always thought that one of the reasons that he has been such an outstanding slugger is because of the amount of hips that he gets and leads the way in his overall swing. With his hips freely in advance of his swing, bringing his arms and shoulders into place, Killebrew's power is at its maximum. Now just let me show you here by restricting uh, the movement in Harmon Killebrew's hips, how it affects the power in his swing. Now go ahead, Harmon, and try to swing, and I'm going to hold your hips back in your swing. Gee, I don't have anything there. I'll let her go through and swing a little bit. Oh. Gee, I don't have anything left with my arms. Yeah, and, and, and as a result, he can't hit with any authority. Johnny Bench is another power hitter with good hip action. With all his strength, however, Bench keeps himself well under control, waiting for the hips to clear the way before bringing his bat into the ball. Bobby Mercer is not nearly as strong as Killebrew or Bench, but he too has good hip action, from the cocking of the hips and hands to the unrestricted rotation of the hips, leading the thrust of his swing. As a result, Mercer can also hit with good power, but remember, hitting is 50% from the neck up. I remember again as a young hitter that I had a chance to meet one of the greatest right-hand hitters that ever played the game. His name was Roger Hornsby. And I had a chance to ask him the same question that I had asked Lefty O'Doul two or three years earlier. And I said to Roger, what do I have to do to become a good hitter? And Roger Hornsby gave me the greatest single bit of advice that I ever got as a hitter. And he said, kid, he says, get a good ball to hit. Now, really, what does that mean? It means up to two strikes. Don't swing at a pitch that's in a tough area of the strike zone, and certainly never swing at a pitch that has fooled you. You have to determine for yourself the zones in which you hit best. Here's my strike zone, showing the areas I consider best for me, where I consistently hit the ball with authority. The ones that were tougher, especially the low outside pitch, I learned to lay off of. Sure, you get occasional base hits from pitches in the gray areas, but more often than not, you hit a bad pitch, a tough spot, and nothing happened. Nothing. I would take pitches like that, let them go by. I believe this. A good hitter can hit a pitch that is over the plate three times better than a great hitter can hit a questionable pitch that is in a tough spot. Pete Rose can often hit pitches in tough spots, but watch how unprofessional it looks for him to swing at a high inside pitch. Then, as he goes slightly off balance to swing at a low outside pitch. And now, see how much better his swing is as he gets good wood on a pitch that is right down his alley. I can't get down a low ball, but if I have my hand... That way, Ted Williams is always that. talking about hitting I, to younger I players. I a little ball better than if I certainly did that. And I think that it helps, uh, maybe, when your wrist is this way, cocked, I'll hold it just a little bit. But ordinarily, ordinarily, most hitters have a, have a grip that's something like this. Well, I, on my top hand, I got a, a real, mm, that right. grip. You know but I on my bottom that. hand, I had this kind of a grip, see? Right, right. Well, I was loose here. But as Williams says, it is not the grip that matters as much as it is the quickness you generate with your bat. Frank Robinson has that quickness. Note that his stride is almost directly toward the pitcher, that the arc of his swing is tight, which increases his bat speed, because the longer the arc, the slower the swing, and that his wrists at impact are not broken, that they do not turn until he is well into his follow-through. Johnny Bench has a strong upper torso, powerful shoulders and arms, and he puts them to good use. He may not be as quick as Robinson, but once he starts bringing his bat around to follow his hips, he can generate tremendous power. Because of his strength, Bench is able to take a longer swing with a wider arc, which is often the mark of a home run hitter. And then the other thing that you're always thinking about, if a fellow can't get quickness, overall quickness, is, and this is certainly a correction that can be made more times than not. 
that his hands are too far away from his body. And when they're too far away from his body, he has a harder time. No yeah, that's right. And harder to get a swing going. In other words, his, his diameter of swing is bigger. Whereas if he tucks them in a little bit, he can get, it's a shorter swing, a shorter stroke. Bobby Mercer is a slider build athlete and has adjusted in the way Williams would have him by adopting a more compact stance. His feet closer together, his elbows and hands nearer his body. He is therefore able to be quicker with his back and that means he can wait that fraction of a second longer to make his decision on a pitch. As Williams would say, he is able to get a good ball to hit. Uh, you take a fellow that doesn't swing the bat real quick, and you say, well, why isn't he quick? He's strong. He grip his hand, he's strong. Uh, he's built strong. And why isn't he quick? There's only two secrets to that, that he isn't getting good hip action. Because without hip action, without the hips leading the way, leading the way, it's impossible to be quick. And this game has to be quick. You're dealing in tenths of seconds from the mound. And it has to be strong because you're trying to hit with authority. And it's impossible to do either one of those without hips ahead of hand, hips leading away. Billy Williams has a hitting style much like Ted Williams' own. He strides, anticipating the pitch, and his hips give the real power to his swing. Now there's one other thing that we haven't talked about, and that is that with a, with a proper grip, a bat that you can handle, with fairly good hip action, with strong, you've got to get some movement going. In other words, you've got to cock a little bit. You've got to get your hands moving so they can, they can start moving, doing things. The beautiful rhythm of a classic swing is exemplified by Al Kaline. He gets the rhythm going with hips, hands, and knees. He makes a balanced stride directly towards the pitcher, lets his hips open to lead the way and follows through with quick hands and good shoulder action. Notice how well he is under control even after impact. Pete Rose is a switch hitter, equally adept from either side of the plate. He has what Williams calls the perfect two-strike swing. When a batter realizes he can't risk striking out, he stays more within himself. He concentrates on hitting the ball through the middle, on getting on top of the pitch. As Rose demonstrates, it is what Williams calls an inside-out swing with the hands ahead of the fat part of the bat at impact. The inside out swing is more compact, allowing Rose to wait that much longer for the pitch. As is usually the case, Rose hits this one to the opposite field. The inside out swing is a good cure for a slump, Williams says, and for a pull hitter who is striking out a lot. There's a darn many things you gotta consider about when we talk about the 50% mental thinking of hitting which I consider as as important as the physical attributes of any hitter. You've got to know the pitcher. You've got to know how you're going to hit him. You've got to know how he got you out before. You've got to know how you, what you did the preceding time at the plate. You've got to know how he's pitching. A good hitter remembers the pitcher's pattern, his speed, his delivery, and what he's got on this particular day. A rule of thumb for me was to take the first pitch. I mean the first pitch in the game. On subsequent times to the plate, that would not apply. But I wasn't just taking a pitch. I was taking a specific pitch. What was it? Fastball? I didn't want to hit until I'd seen a fastball. You don't hit at anything you haven't seen once. In this sequence, Pete Rose is not sure what the opposing pitcher has got. He takes the first pitch. He's seen a pitch. He's ready for it if it comes again. He takes another, storing up information. He's waiting for that good pitch. And if he gets it, watch out. Here's the pitch. And also a line drive to left field for two bases. Taking those pitches paid off. Now the pitcher has to face Johnny Bench, who now has a little advantage because of Rose's turn at bat. Much of your preparation at this point is a matter of being observant, of picking up things. 
How did he pitch the batter before you? You think of the count. The game situation. Pitches that seem to be working for him. You take advantage of every opening. What you're doing is building a frame of reference to work from. You make a mistake and swing at that first pitch, and the chances are the next time up there will be a couple of men on in a tight spot, and you're still not sure what he's got. If you make the pitcher throw four or five pitches, you've built yourself a frame of reference. Now you've seen the varied styles and techniques of the great hitters. Some things you might want to copy or try for yourself. If they're not right for you, then discard them. For example, try a stance that feels good, or that you've seen work for someone else, or maybe a different bat. But what's important is to experiment, to adapt. Like any science, good hitting requires it. But remember this, to do anything well in sports, you have to practice. Hitting a baseball is no different. You've just got to take the time to work at it. And this means practice, and more practice, and more practice. You'd better, if you want to be a hitter, because it's the toughest thing to do in sports. The inside out there. When you can get him thinking out there, it has to work for your advantage because remember one thing about the pitcher. What about it? He's the dumbest guy in the ballpark, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. No, we all agree on that. It's Directly. 